Before we begin, I'd like to plug the Think Torah podcast with our own Walgalenter. Our own is a good friend of mine, and he launched an amazing podcast called Think Torah. And he actually interviewed me about my podcasting bad story and my plans and my hopes and my dreams for the future. And it turned into a general discussion about the concept of using new media, a new technology to spread Torah. We discussed at length my philosophies on these issues. It got a little spicy as well. It was a very fun, lively, engaging conversation. If this is something you're interested in listening to, go to uh, wherever you listen to podcasts and listen to Think Torah with our own Wall Galerter. Now, last week, I was fortunate enough to launch my email newsletter, and it was an incredible experience. The feedback that I got was absolutely tremendous, and I really appreciate all of y'all who read it and who were kind enough to send me your thoughts about it. And so many people reached out and shared with me how they felt when they attended a Shabbos meal in an observant home for the first time. And I mentioned this in the in the email that this is one of my missions in life to try to do as much as I can to unite the various different strata of our people. And I mentioned that when someone goes to a Torah and Shabbos fully observant home for Shabbos, they're a little bit uncomfortable, they have some anxiety. And I mentioned in the email that maybe I'll do a podcast on it, but now thanks to this overwhelming response, I do plan indeed, please God, to do a podcast on it. So if you have not sent me your experiences, email me, rabbiwalbajima.com. Now, if you have not yet gotten the newsletter and you want to sample it, go to my website, rabbiwalby.com, and you scroll down until you see the newsletter. And if you're interested, you can sign up, rabbiwalby.com forward slash newsletter. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalbajima.com. In this week's Parsha, we have arguably the most bizarre episode in the whole Torah. Sarah dies in the immediate aftermath of the episode of the binding of Isaac. Someone tells her, oh no, Isaac is being offered as a sacrifice. She has a heart attack. She dies of shock. And the Parsha begins with Abraham mourning, bewailing, eulogizing Sarah, and then he turns his attention to try to find a burial spot for him. And it's bizarre because you have essentially 18 verses to describe the negotiations that Abraham had with the gentleman named Ephron who owned the plot of land that Abraham was interested in purchasing. And it goes back and forth. Ephron says, take the cave, take the field, I'll give it to you for free. Abraham bows in appreciation, but Abraham says, no, I don't want it for free, I want to pay full price. Eventually, everyone says, okay, well, what about 400 silver coins? And Abraham says, deal, and he gives him the 400 superior coins, legal tender in every location, and he buys the field, and he buys the cave, and he buries Sarah. Now, if you look at the Talmud, you will see books of Talmud that are based on fewer verses than this story. You will see entire sections of Torah that stem from one or two verses in the Torah. And here we have 18 verses, a tremendous amount of real estate in the Torah to describe what is seemingly a simple real estate transaction. Abraham wants to buy a field, he wants to buy a cave, and he gets it from the guy named Ephron who owns it. The Torah seemingly could have just ignored the entire subject and say that Abraham buried his wife in the field that he bought, and that would be apparently Sufficient. So what I want to do today is to try to go a bit deeper into the story to share some observations that I had with a disclaimer, though, that some of them are still in the germination stage. There's a whole bunch of interesting insights and questions that I think present us with something really big. But I don't think that I have the full resolution of everything that's going on over here, but I think it's worthwhile to probe it nonetheless. So Abraham is very intent on getting this specific burial spot for his wife, but it's not immediately clear why. Why does he covet this particular burial spot, this field, and this 
cave, this duplex of a cave, to bury Sarah. So the Midrash clues us in. The Midrash tells us that in last week's Parsha, when Abraham had three guests who came to visit him, and it turns out that they were actually angels masquerading as guests, but Abraham launches into this incredible frenzied effort to wine and dine his guests. And the verse says in chapter 18, verse 7, Ve'el habakar ratz Avram, Abraham was chasing or was running to the cattle. And he took a baby calf that was soft and was really good and he gave it to Ishmael and he says, okay, we're making steaks for our guests. The Midrash tells us what actually happened over here. When the angels appeared to him, he thought that they were ordinary travelers. And he ran towards them and he wanted to make them a big feast. So he tells Sarah, let's make a big feast. And he runs to go get fresh cattle to slaughter to make fresh steaks for his guests. But one of the calves that he wanted was really choice-looking beef. One of the calves escaped from him and began running away from him. So he was chasing and pursuing this runaway cow. And this cow, this calf, hides in a cave. So Abraham enters the cave to find the calf, and he discovers Adam and Eve laying down on beds and sleeping, i.e. they're deceased, and there are candles lit. He has discovered the burial place of Adam and Eve. And he smells the wafting aroma of the garden. And from that point forward, Abraham coveted this particular cave to bury himself and his wife after their passing. So Abraham goes back to wine and dine his guests, and 38 years later, Sarah's now passed, and Abraham finds the owner of that cave and starts negotiation. Now the Kabbalists add some color to the story. The Kabbalists tell us that Abraham wanted to get three distinct separate cows or calves for his three guests so that way everyone could have the best part of the animal. And the angel, Raphael, impersonated a cow. And the Kabbalists point out that the word Raphael the four letters that spell out that word can also be rearranged as par el, meaning the, the cow, the bovine of God. So Raphael, the angel, takes on the appearance of a cow or of a bull, but a really good, juicy one. So Abraham sees that one amongst his cows. He says, oh, I want to get this one for my guests. It's the best looking piece of beef I've ever seen. And this animal, which is really an angel, we're told by the Gabalists, runs away from him, goes to the entrance of the cave, and Abraham discovers Adam and Eve interred there with the candles. And the Kabbalists conclude that this cave is the courtyard of the garden. It's the courtyard of paradise. It's one of the places where the two worlds meet. It's one of the entrances, the portals, to paradise. And therefore, this is a very special place. Abraham wants it. Now, the next question we have to ask is, how exactly did Adam and Eve end up over there? And again, we find the answer in the Midrash. The Midrash tells us that after Adam and Eve were booted from the garden, they were intent on getting back. And when Eve died, Adam wanted to bury her, and he found this cave, and he smelled the distinct aroma of the garden, and he said, oh my goodness, here's a way for me to get back in. He was kicked out after their sin, and the Almighty placed the swirling, flaming swords above the entrance of the garden so Adam can't get back in. But now, apparently, Adam has found another entrance. So he furiously starts digging 
to be able to discover the entrance. And a prophetic voice boomed out, Stop! Go no further. You're getting too close and you cannot go any closer. And therefore, Adam buried his wife there. And he had himself buried there after he passed. And no one knew about this location until Abraham rediscovered it many, many centuries later. So this backstory of this cave, it obviously makes the Torah's treatment of this cave, it makes it a little bit more clear. This is not some ordinary cave. This is where Adam and Eve are buried. And this is one of the portals to paradise. But there's more. The Zohar tells us that when someone prays, if you pray, let's say in Houston, Texas, that prayer has to travel to heaven. How does it go to heaven? It says the Zohar, it has to first travel to the city of Hebron, to Hebron. It has to go into the cave, and through the cave, it has a portal to heaven, and that's how it travels there. All prayer must first go to the entrance, to the crossover, to the DMZ between this world and the heavenly spheres before it can be delivered to God. What an interesting idea. The Kabbalists add that normally when someone goes to paradise, there's the lower garden and then there's the upper garden. And normally someone has to spend some time in the lower garden before they can ascend to the upper garden. But there's a shortcut. There's a way to bypass the whole process. And anyone who is buried in the cave of the patriarchs, in the cave of Machpelah, is able to bypass the entire bureaucratic process of spending time in the lower garden, in the lower paradise, and could go straight up to the highest level. Almost like the VIP tickets in Disneyland. You could bypass the line. So this is really interesting. And I think this raises some questions. This cave is a portal to heaven. This is where the prayers have to go. And what's interesting, maybe this is a question. In a few weeks, we're going to read about Jacob. He is escaping from his brother, who wants to kill him, his twin brother. And he has a very dramatic experience on Mount Moriah where he has a dream and there's a ladder and there's angels going up the ladder and there's angels coming down the ladder and he wakes up in the morning and he has a whole prayer and he has a declaration. V'zeh shar hashemaim. This is the gates of heaven. Says Rashi. What does it mean this is the gates of heaven? This is the place where prayer ascends heavenwardly. So to me, this was a little bit of a question. How could we be told that the prayer has to travel to Hebron, to the cave of the patriarchs to go to heaven, when we're told also a very different place in Jerusalem, on Mount Moriah, on Temple Mount, that's where the prayer ascends to heaven. Which one is it? So my dear brother-in-law that I mention all the time here, Shmuley Botnik, tells me that apparently there are at least two entrances to heaven or two portals, two places in this world where there is a touch point between this world and the next world. And the word Hebron or Hebron, Hebron, if you rearrange the letters of Hebron, you have the word Churban, which means destruction. We know Temple Mount, that is when there's no destruction, there's a temple there. And that is a direct connection between the two worlds. That's what the temple's all about. Maybe Hebron is like the back entrance when the front entrance is closed and you want to sneak in nonetheless when there is Churban, when there's destruction. Temple Mount is no longer, it's blockaded. It's, there's no longer a way to get through there. Maybe you could use the circuitous route, the back entrance, to still connect to heaven, which is a really interesting idea. And consequently, if you kind of zoom out a little bit, there's a juxtaposition between the two entrances. The very last event in last week's parsha was, of course, 
the Binding of Isaac, which happened on Mount Moriah, which is one of the entrances. And the first event in this week's parasha is the other entrance, namely that of the Cave of the Patriarchs. So again, what this means, this is still being developed. But here's another interesting idea. If we're saying that the Cave of the Patriarchs is a portal to heaven, well, who purchases it? Abraham purchases it. Abraham buys it from Ephraim. And Abraham is interred there. He's buried there. Together with his wife Sarah, eventually Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob, and his first wife, Leah. Eight people, four couples buried there. But who bought it? Abraham bought it. So Abraham, you would say, is the nominal owner of this cave, of this choke point between the two worlds. So here's the idea that I had. There's an astonishing midrash in a few weeks we'll read about it. And as an aside, I have a particular affinity for this midrash because at my son, my oldest son Akiva's bris, 12 and a half years ago, he's almost bar mitzvah now, which is kind of crazy. But I spoke by my son's bris and I quoted this midrash. And listen to what the midrash says. The midrash tells us that in the beginning of last week's parsha, Abraham is sitting at the entrance of the tent. And it's the hottest day of the year. It's boiling hot. Scorching heat. Rashi says, God took out the sun from its sheath and made it the hottest day of the year. Hottest day ever. Says the Midrash, Abraham is sitting at the entrance and it's really, really hot. Says the Midrash, in the future... Abraham is going to sit at another entrance of someplace that's very hot, namely Gehenom, namely Purgatory. And he's going to be the gatekeeper of hell. And every person that's a good candidate to go into hell, Abraham's going to save them if they are circumcised. The circumcision is the covenant of Abraham. And Abraham, because he's going to be the gatekeeper of purgatory, if someone is part of his covenant, someone's part of his select fraternity, if someone is circumcised, he's not going to allow them in. But what if, says the Midrash, there's someone who's such a terrible sinner, does so many sins, and they really need to be cleansed, they really need to go through some sort of process where their soul is polished and shined. But they're circumcised. So what happens, says the Midrash, they remove a foreskin from a baby who died before they were circumcised and they slap it on the guy who really needs to go spend some time in purgatory and then he could enter. But if someone is circumcised, there's no way. Abraham won't let it. This is just an astonishing, very dramatic, very vivid Midrash. And during my speech that I made by my son Akiva's bris, I talked about the power of the covenant of Abraham. What does this mean? Like just just this minor surgery that we do to Jewish boys at eight days old, that makes them part of this very select club that has eternal consequences. That was the subject then. But it occurred to me that now Abraham is buying the cave, which we discovered is the entrance to paradise. So Abraham is the gatekeeper both of paradise and of purgatory. Abraham's the double gatekeeper. He sits by the door of both heaven and hell. What an interesting idea. What an interesting observation. Again, this is almost like half baked, but this is something that we have to figure out. What does this mean about Abraham? And here's another thought. Who is the current owner of the cave in the field? It's a guy named Ephron. Well, what do we know about Ephron? We know very little about him. His only appearance in the Torah is in this episode. But he is mentioned once in the Talmud. The Talmud of the book of Bab page 87a says the following. Listen to this. (laughs) 
it again goes back to the beginning of last week's parsha. Abraham has his three guests. And he says, I want you to come stay with me. I'm going to feed you. And he tells him, this is in chapter 18, verse 7, I will give you a piece of bread. That's what he promised the three guests, which, of course, we know were angels. So he promised some bread. But what does he actually deliver? He runs and delivers steak and three different animals for the three guests. Says the Talmud, from this we learn that the tzaddikim, the righteous, they say a little, but they do a lot. Abraham is the poster child. He's the archetype. He's the paragon of someone who under promises, but over delivers. He only promises a piece of bread, delivers three cows, lots of steak, a tremendous feast. Continues the Talmud. Who is the opposite? Who is the anti-Abraham? Who over-promises but under-delivers? Says the Talmud. The wicked. They say a lot. Big talkers. But even a little, they don't do. And how do we know this? From Ephron. Ephron promises, Oh, I love you, Abraham. I want to give it to you for free. He promises big. In the end, he under-delivers. He demands an exorbitant price way above market value for his cave and his field. So this to me I think is very interesting. First of all, we have a principle. This is something we mentioned in last year's Parsha podcast. We talked about it a few times, I think. There's a principle that things always have to be balanced. The Almighty created this world, and the purpose of creation is that people have free will. And therefore, if there's too much power favoring one side, then the free will is lost, and therefore the purpose of creation is also lost. And therefore, if you have prophecy, you must have idolatry. That was the idea that we mentioned last year. And we mentioned that if you have a Moses, you have to have an anti-Moses. You have to have someone of equal strength to Moses that's pulling in the opposite direction. So we spoke about Bilam. Bilam is the prophet who rivals Moshe, but on the complete opposite side of the spectrum. And that way, when you are strung between these two great people, you have Moshe pulling you to righteousness and holiness, and you have Bilam pulling you to the opposite direction, and it's equal. Neither side has the advantage. If there's a Moses, there's got to be an anti-Moses. If there's an Aaron, there has to be an anti-Aaron, someone with the same power and persuasion pulling in the opposite direction. Ergo, we could say that if there's an Abraham, there must be an anti-Abraham. There must be someone who is as equally as powerful and persuasive as Abraham, but in the opposite direction. So maybe we could speculate the fact that we're told here that there's two people on opposite sides of the spectrum. Abraham most personifies someone who under-promises and over-delivers, and Ephron is the exact opposite, the polar opposite. He's the one who embodies over-promising and under-delivering. Maybe Ephron is the anti-Abraham. Maybe. But to me, I think there's another point here. Isn't it interesting that this transaction that happens at the beginning of our Parsha, it takes place between the person who most personifies over-delivering, that's Abraham, and the person who most personifies under-delivering, and that's Ephron. It's obviously not a coincidence. Moreover, when did Abraham discover the cave? When he was over-delivering, after he had told his guests, I'm going to give you some bread. And he over-delivers. And he runs to go get steak. Specifically, when he is demonstrating his over-delivering, that's when he discovers the cave, which is in the hands of the person that most represents under-delivering. So to me, it seems clear that there's some sort of connection between this characteristic and this location. The location of this cave, which we said is the nexus connecting two worlds, the portal to heaven, the courtyard of paradise. There's something really deep about what's happening in these 18 verses in our Parsha that is 
embodied by the characteristic of Abraham versus that of Ephron. And this is something I'm trying to figure out, trying to crack this code, trying to decipher this riddle. This is a mystery, and we could sense that there's something there, and it demands our attention. One more thing about this location. So we know Sarah's buried there, Adam and Eve is buried there, and in the end of our Parsha, Abraham passes, and he's buried there, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob, and Leah as well. What happened when Jacob was going to be buried there? This is all the way in the end of Genesis. There are already seven people who are buried there. And there's only room for one more person. And Jacob, of course, dies in Egypt. And he is transported back to Israel, back to the land of Canaan, to be buried in the cave of the patriarchs. So the Talmud tells us there was a very dramatic standoff between Jacob's brother, Esau, and his men, and they were trying to prevent Jacob from being buried there. And the people who are carrying Jacob, they just can't believe it. This is just so unconscionable. You're not allowing us to bury the dead? And Esau responds, well, it's mine. It's mine by right. But they tell him, no, you sold your right to it. So Esau says, okay, well, where's the proof? Where's the contract? And they realize, Ive, we left the contract in Egypt. So Naphtali, who was the swiftest of Jacob's sons, he rushes back to Egypt to try to get the contract so that way they could bury Jacob. Meanwhile, everyone's just milling about waiting and Jacob's grandson, a deaf boy by the name of Hushim, he is not really following what's happening. And he signals to someone, what's going on? Why are we not burying Jacob? So they respond to him in sign language. They point to Esau and they say, this man is stopping it. And he's like, how is that even possible? This man is going to stop my grandfather being buried? He takes a sword or takes a stick and he decapitates Esau. Esau's head rolls into the cave and all of Esau's people flee and Jacob is allowed to be buried. And interestingly, we're told, my grandfather used to always speak about this, that Esau's head is buried alongside the eight people in the cave. My grandfather used to always say that what this tells us, of course, Esau, we're going to meet in next week's parsha, but this tells us that Esau, in his head, if you just divorce the rest of his body, in his head, he was equivalent to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The problem was that the influence of his brain, what he knew, did not penetrate to his body. It did not affect how he behaved. But I say just tell us something very deep about this episode of the burial of Jacob. Our sages tell us that this story is a harbinger of the final showdown before Messiah. Esau, he is the father of Edom. And we're going to read in a couple of weeks, 43 verses in chapter 36, about the entire legacy and lineage of Esau. And we're told in Scripture that the very last battle before Messiah is going to be between the Jewish people, Jacob, i.e., and Esau. And then, there's going to be this encounter with Esau, and only then will God have dominion. And the Arizal points out that the name Chushim, the deaf son of Dan, who decapitated Esav, the letters Chushim, spelled without a vav, are the same letters as Mashiach. So this story is emblematic of the future events of the Messianic era. There's going to be a deaf person, so to speak, someone who is going to be Mashiach, someone who is going to be overlooked, and that Mashiach is going to swoop in and destroy Esau and be able to effectuate this final redemption. 
And where is that showdown? Where is the front line, so to speak, between these two sides? We're told, again, if you just look at the story, we're told that that is done in this location on this cave. There's something about this place that symbolizes the final showdown. And what exactly that is, is, of course, a great mystery. Now, I feel like this podcast might be a little bit underwhelming because I'm asking more questions, sharing more observations, and not really giving resolutions. But my grandfather, blessed memory, used to always say that the way you crack the code of the mysteries of Torah is you let the ideas percolate. You, so to speak, marinate within the ideas. You ruminate over something. You cogitate over it. And eventually, it will click. But I think for sure, there's a very powerful takeaway. You read the story simply, and it's, again, just a real estate transaction between two people. And you kind of wonder, what's this big hullabaloo about this purchase of the field and the cave, the burial spot, whole negotiations back and forth? Why is it significant? And I think we know now that there's something really deep and really profound going on over here. Okay, even though this entire podcast has been like a long extended A&Q, I want to have a designated A&Q along these lines. So here's question number one. This field is very powerful. It's the field in the cave where Adam and Eve are buried. It's the portal to heaven. And who owns it? Some wicked person, we're told, named Ephron, who's the polar opposite of Abraham. Yet he owns this very cherished, very powerful field and cave. How did the worst guy, the person who most embodies over-promising and under-delivering, how did he end up with the choicest, most precious, most cherished land? Question number one. Question number two, again, this is along the same lines, there is an interesting midrash. The midrash tells us that there are three instances in scripture, where there is a purchase of real estate, namely the cave, the story of our Parsha. In a few weeks, we're going to read about the purchase of the suburbs of Shechem. Remember that city? The suburbs of Shechem was purchased by Jacob, and that is where Joseph is buried. And finally, King David buys Temple Mount and Jerusalem from a guy named Arnon. Says the Midrash, there are three places that are ours and our claim to it cannot be disputed by the Gentiles because we purchased it. We paid money for it. And the question is, what is the significance of these three places that they need to be purchased, these three places specifically, the cave of our Parsha, Temple Mount, and the burial place of Joseph, why are these three places that need to be purchased with money in order to dispel any questions on our ownership of them? Okay, let's go to last week's question. Last week, if you remember, we asked the question, the A&Q of last week, Parshas Vayera, was in the run-up to the binding of Isaac. God tells Abram, Kach, no, please take your son, offer him as a sacrifice. And Rashi quotes from the Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin, that the word na means please. God is pleading from Abraham because you know what? If you fail, then the first ones, or at least people will say that the first ones had no substance. And the question is why? Why if someone does 90% of a job, it's still pretty good. Why would Abraham, in the event that he would fail at this last test, why would that negate all the triumphs that he did previously? So again, I got a bunch of answers from the amazing listeners of the Parsha podcast. Again, the best listeners of any podcast in the world, in my opinion. And I would say they fell into two broad categories. Some of the answers highlighted the fact that this is the only test that involves 
Abraham and his successor, Isaac. All the previous tests were for Abraham and Abraham alone. And Abraham, of course, is a great person. He's the founder of monotheism, the founder of this movement. But there's a big difference between a movement and an eternal nation. If Isaac is not on board, if Isaac is not the successor, the heir to Abraham, who could fully hold his own with Abraham, then it's going to die. Our nation is built, of course, on Abraham, but on the triumvirate of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If any one of them are not part of this, then we have nothing really. These 10 tests are more about just Abraham excelling. This is the building blocks of our people. And this is the one that brings in Isaac. This is the one that determines the continuity of what Abraham built. And therefore, this one is super important because if we don't have this one, all we have is a great individual, but really it's nothing because it does not endure. Very powerful insight. A bunch of listeners had a similar kind of answer where they said that, yes, it is all or nothing. When Abraham passed his last trial, his last test, it was sort of like an exit exam, one of the listeners wrote. You know, a doctor has to pass their boards, a lawyer has to pass the bar. If you fail this test, then even though you have your your, your juris doctor, and even though you have your experience and your education, you're not qualified, which I thought was interesting. Um, one of the podcast listeners who's a dear friend of mine, he said that this week they discovered or they, they released the news about a coronavirus vaccine that has 90% efficacy. So he said that for biology, 90% is good enough, but not for Abraham. My grandfather, blessed memory, he quoted his teacher who said that if you have a pot that has a hole in it, it's not a 90% of a pot. It's 0%. There are some jobs that are indeed all or nothing. If you get onto a plane and your destination is, let's say, New York City, and they land you somewhere, I don't know, in Washington, D.C., you want a full refund. You don't say, hey, uh, they got me 90% of my destination. I'll only pay 90%. No. The job to be done here is 100%. And it's all or nothing. If you don't get me to my destination, you haven't done your job. And it's not even like a 90% success. It's zero. And maybe we can broaden this idea. The first test of Abraham, at least the first one that's mentioned in Scripture, is where he's told, Lech Lecha, go. Go for yourself. In the last test of Abraham, the test of the binding of Isaac, it also begins... Take your son, v'lech lecha, and go. And the fact that the Torah, God is still using the same verbiage, maybe that suggests this is really one continuous test with ten parts. And the test is there to determine, will Abraham actualize his mission, his life purpose? The last test is the actualization of what he started in the first lachacha, the first test. My grandfather, blessed memories, will always say that the Ten Commandments, the first one is about faith, and the last one, thou shall not covet, that is actualized faith. When you don't covet what someone else has, it's only because you really, in your bones, believe that it's the Almighty who is allocating resources. Maybe we can suggest that these ten tests are really paralleling, are really mirroring the Ten Commandments. And by the way, there are those people who say that. And therefore, if you fail at the last one, you've essentially failed at all of them. Because the last one is just the implementation and actualization of all of them since the very first one, since the very first Lech Lecha. So thank you all for sending in your amazing responses. And thank you for listening to this edition of the Parsha Podcast. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Volby. I'm coming to you from the Torch Center in... Houston, Texas. Our website is torchweb.org. Have an amazing Shabbos. And please, God, I look forward to speaking to y'all next week in good health and in great spirits.